Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's great to have an in-person conference again. So, I, as, uh, as already mentioned, I will talk about the other uh, accelerator beam neutrino oscillation experiment uh, called Hyper-K. And as you obviously all, uh, all know, Hyper-K is the third instance of uh, the Kamio Kande series, starting with the kiloton scale experiment. Uh, and then in the mid 90s, you had Super K with 50 kilotons, and now we're moving to 260 kilotons. So uh, if you have ever been in, uh, in Super K and in, suspended in the middle of the detector uh, from a window washing gondola, it's a dizzying experience. And I'm wondering how this one will feel like when you. Yeah. When we build it. So, so sadly, the collaboration picture is a, uh, is a Zoom picture, but we are a large collaboration and still growing. We have about 500 people as, as of now. So, the most important message today is that uh, Hyper K is no longer just the future, it has already started. So this was the groundbreaking ceremony. And by now we have an access tunnel to nowhere. So uh, uh, it ends in the middle of the mountain, but uh, you can see uh, things are moving forward. I don't know whether this will work or not. Doesn't it need something in here? here. Yeah, oh. oh, it's all, it's already in here, okay. So uh, Hyper-K involves two new detectors. Uh, one is the far detector, obviously. And the other one is an uh, intermediate water Trenkov detector, which will be gadolinium doped and using uh, multi-PMT modules. Ah, it does work. <laughs> and uh, so this maybe is the most important part of this talk is the uh, schedule. Uh, when will we, when can we expect Hyper-K to start data take? Now jump right ahead. We expect in the, uh, in the first quarter of 2027 that data taking will start. And so there are multiple things that will have to happen. This is sort of the excavation part. Then this is the PMT part, the water system. And in parallel, the upgrade of the beam facility and the new detector facility. So there's some more pictures of the access tunnel and actually also the PMD production has started and we have received the first 300 PMTs. And those are the 20 inch PMTs. And they were newly developed for, uh, for Hyper-K. They were uh, they distinguished from the uh, Super-K 20 inch PMTs by a new dyno structure, which improves the timing resolution and charge resolution. So we need 20,000 of those, not just 300, but uh, they are also high quantum efficiency for, uh, PMTs, which means that the single photon e effective efficiency uh, roughly doubles, while the dark noise is comparable to uh, what we had in Super-K. So these are complemented by uh, uh, multi-PMT modules. So these are modules looking like this, consisting out of uh, 19 three-inch PMTs. And in all honesty, they don't give you much more light yield than for, uh, what the 20, 20 inch PMTs give by themselves, but uh, they have different features like in, improved granularity, directionality, and uh, slightly better time resolution. And the main purpose of those will be to reduce systematic errors, to uh, have a complementary measurement of the trank of light and thereby reducing uh, systematic errors uh, that are peculiar to water trend of it. So uh, this is the photosensor configuration on the detector walls. So as in 
in super K, we have a, an inner detector and an outer detector, meaning a two concentric cylinders separated by a black sheet and a reflective Tyvek. And so here you can see the 20 inch PMTs mounted with uh, multi PMTs in between. And then on the outer detector side, we have three inch PMTs with wavelength shifter plates. And together with the reflective tie rate, they will have enough uh, light yield to measure entering neurons. And unlike super K, the electronics of the detector will be in the water. And so we have these canisters which contain both the ID and the OD electronics. So here's a picture of the outer detector three inch PMT with the wavelength shifter plate. So of course we need uh, new detectors and uh, we can take advantage of uh, the T2K new detectors. And uh, so we will still have Ingrid, the trusted beam monitor of T2K uh, doing duty uh, even for uh, the Hyper-K project. Then we have the ND280 off-axis uh, off detector, which uh, will be upgraded uh, for T2K phase two, where the Pi zero detector is replaced by three new detectors. And then finally, we have this, uh, this new uh, intermediate water trink of detector. And because it's a water trink of detector, we hope for some cancellation of systematics uh, peculiar to, the, to that technique. And also, since the detector is movable, we can change the off axis angle and uh, get cross section as a function of neutrino energy. So these are event pictures uh, simulated for hyper-K uh, at both the high energy and at the low energy for muons and for electrons. And uh, these are our basic neutrino interaction channels. And we, for event reconstruction, we use timing for the vertex, the rings for the track directions, the brightness for the track momentum, and the sharpness for the particle ID. So this is a list of the hyper-K physics signals uh, on an energy scale. So we will be sensitive from the few MeV to the TeV scale and uh, starting solar, supernova, accelerator, uh, neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, search for proton decay and do dark matter searches, as well as having some sensitivity to astrophysical neutrinos. So the fiducial mass is gonna be 190 kilotons compared to 22.5 kilotons for uh, super K. So let me start with the accelerator neutrinos. So uh, let me contrast the two different strategies between uh, Dune and hyper K. And the point is not so much by, uh, by calling hyper case superior or inferior to it, but rather stressing that uh, having both is going to be for the good of the uh, neutrino physics community. So in Dune, we have uh, the long baseline to have optimal sensitivity to matter effects. And use, it uses a high energy wide band beam to uh, measure oscillation patterns for wide energy range for both neutrinos and anti neutrinos. And you have an extremely capable fine grain detector so that it can use all cross section channels to do neutrino measurements. And of course, it has uh, new detectors to characterize the beam. And in hyper K, the philosophy is to have a shorter baseline to reduce correlations between CP violations and matter effects and uh, have a low energy or lower energy not really low energy, but lower energy and narrow band beam to focus on charge current quasi elastic and an inexpensive water triangle detector that has is less capable in its tracking, but we have more of it. We have a larger mass. And then we use the extra mass to measure atmospheric neutrinos and use that, uh, those atmospheric neutrinos to get, gain sensitivity on the matter effects. 
And we have uh, also near detectors to characterize the beam. Uh, the additional intermediate detector is needed because we can't really have a water trend of detector at 280 meters because of event pileup. The detector needs to have a certain size to contain muons, and then you get multiple events in each beam spill. So, uh, in, in summary, the, these two approaches are, uh, are complementary in almost every aspect. And so that should help us uh, disentangle uh, physics effects. Uh, if, for example, the oscillation structure is more complicated than just the usual uh, three neutrino scenario from uh, detector systematics, for example, cross sections. So this is the hyper K CP violation sensitivity. And uh, I'll first draw your attention to uh, the ideal case where we already know the mass, uh, the mass ordering, uh, which is shown by the solid line from the beam uh, by itself, which is shown by the blue lines. So this is normal mass ordering, inverted mass ordering. And so you see, we get in that ideal case, we get uh, good coverage of delta CP values with pi sigma discrimination against no CP violation. However, if we drop the, um, that we know the true mass hierarchy or mass ordering, then go from here to down here to this blue line down here. So in one half of the phase space, uh, we drop significantly below the five sigma for most values. And we can recover that by uh, uh, use, uh, using the atmospheric neutrinos. And then you get to these uh, black lines. And even when we don't know the, uh, the ordering, we stay above the five sigma for uh, most of these ranges. Our resolution of the delta parameter is quite similar as what was just presented for Dune. It's a little bit larger for uh, maximum CP violation, but it's fairly similar. This is how it evolves as a function of exposure. So uh, we also wanna measure the, uh, the octant of theta, uh, theta two, three. And for a large range of values, we can uh, discriminate against the wrong act, uh, octant by greater than five sigma, except for this range here, when there's almost no uh, difference in the octant. And if you if if three sigma is good enough for you, then uh, this range is slightly smaller. So uh, atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, there would be a lot of things to say about atmospheric neutrinos. They're uh, very interesting in their own right. But uh, here we're just using them because of they probe extremely long baselines. And so if you have very strong matter effects, if neutrinos pass uh, deep inside the Earth. And for the normal ordering, this appearance channel is enhanced. And for inverted ordering, this one is enhanced. And so with the beam and atmospheric data combined, we can exclude the wrong ordering by four to six uh, sigma, depending on the mixing angle. And so there's synergy between the beam and the atmospheric neutrino analysis, and we make use of it. So originally, Kamiokande uh, stood for Kamiokande nucleon decay experiment. And so uh, HyperK will continue the series and will have world leading uh, sensitivities in many different modes. So they're not just the two iconic modes, uh, the uh, E plus pi zero and uh, neutrino K plus, but there are many other modes. And so these are super K limits and this is how much they improve for hyper K. And for those two iconic modes, uh, we make substantial progress over super K for E plus pi zero and we will be competitive for uh, neutrino K plus with uh, Dune and also with uh, Juno, which should make measurements here. 
in this plot, we assume a certain ramp of uh, the uh, Dune detector mass as a function of time. So let me now switch to uh, uh, other physics topics. So first of all, uh, what I find the most interesting uh, that is uh, supernova neutrinos. So uh, galactic or nearby pro-collapse supernova are fairly rare. Uh, there have been, as far as I know, about six of those recorded in human history which means roughly during the last 1800 years. And given that we only see about 20% of the galaxy, the remnants of these uh, can be found in our neighborhood, basically. We can expect about uh, two pro-collapse supernova per century. So it's a grading game mostly. And of course we had one additional observed supernova in Andromeda and one in the large Magellanic cloud a bit more recently. These events are extremely interesting and you can learn a lot by looking at neutrinos. In the case of super K, we would expect about 50,000 to 80,000 uh, neutrino interactions at the galactic center. And six to 10 events in Andromeda at a distance of 750 kiloparsecs. And that's to be compared to 11 neutrinos detected at Kamioka and uh, eight at IMB at a distance of 50 kiloparsecs. And we get directionality from the elastic scattering channel. And with that, we can determine the supernova direction to better than four degrees here from using the Wilson model. And uh, these are the various uh, in number of interactions in the various channels as a function of distance. So uh, in addition to looking at for neutrino physics, we can also look at astrophysical questions such as the explosion mechanisms, uh, the proto-neutron star formation, black hole formation. And uh, you, we will be part of multi-messenger astronomy that includes giving an early alert to other experiments with the directional information. And this will, this will be very useful for gravitational wave and detectors and gamma ray and x-ray telescopes. So uh, let's first talk about uh, supernova model discrimination. So our measurement will basically be very precise determination of the time profile and the energy spectrum, or even energy spectrum as a function of time. And we have a chance to observe the explosion mechanism, for example, the so the oscillation here. And uh, uh, we may observe a uh, black hole formation in this plot over here. And uh, we should be able to distinguish uh, with fairly good accuracy five of the more recent supernova models uh, with just a few hundred events. So that corresponds distance wise from uh, uh, supernova going up to about 100 kiloparsecs. So this is a matrix plot of the likelihood ratios for, uh, for these five, uh, sorry, four, uh, in this plot there are only four, uh, using 100 events each. And you can see that there's fairly little uh, possibility of confusion between them. The more events we have, the easier it is to separate those models. So all of these here have 100 events each and uh, assume 20% photocathode uh, cathode coverage. So in addition to uh, looking for nearby supernova, you can also look for more distant supernova, uh, usually called the DSMB, the diffuse flux. So this is a constant neutrino flux from all supernova in the universe up to a redshift of about one after which they disappear energy-wise into the background, into reactor background, for example. So with Hyper-K, we can move beyond the discovery of, the, uh, of that supernova neutrino signal 
uh, to study those uh, neutrinos across the universe. It depends a little bit on the neutron tagging ability of uh, hyper-K. Since hyper-K does not, in its baseline, include gadolinium doping, it, that depends on the photocathode coverage. So at 20% coverage, we can expect a neutron tagging efficiency of on the order of 40%, and it goes up to 70% with, uh, with the, uh, the higher coverage of 40%. So you move roughly between the, uh, the violet and the red uh, curves as a function of observation. And that translates into 70 plus minus 17 events or with a significance of about four sigma or the higher photo coverage of 40 plus minus 13 with a significance of three sigma. So what can we learn from, uh, from those? Uh, we can uh, compare the star formation rate with the supernova uh, explosion rate. And currently there's about a factor of a two of two discrepancy between the optical observation of uh, supernova and what's expected from the cosmic star formation history. You can measure the uh, temperature of typical supernova explosions uh, from the positron energy spectrum. So this is the energy spectrum for different neutrino temperatures, effective neutrino temperatures at, uh, at the star. And so it's quite different than having a single galactic supernova or uh, there you learn something about that supernova, but not necessarily about uh, whether that's typical or not for a supernova across the universe. And then we can uh, see uh, if there's anything unusual uh, black hole formation supernova rate or optically dim supernova rate, etc. cetera. Uh, lastly, let me talk about potential solar neutrino observations in uh, hyper-K. Obviously, since it's a Cherenkov detector, we are only sensitive to those uh, higher energy boron-8 and HEP neutrinos from the PP chain. And we will have no sensitivity at all from the CNO side which is unfortunate because that is one of the more interesting questions in solar neutrino physics. However, we will detect the boron-8 and HEP neutrinos with directionality, which makes us more tolerant of background. We can distinguish solar neutrino interactions from radioactive background uh, by the angular signature. And we will be sensitive to this interesting transition region of the solar MSW effect between the higher energy uh, matter-dominated flavor conversion to the average vacuum oscillations at lower energies. This band here is from uh, Super-K and Snow using Born 8 neutrinos, and we should be able to improve on that and see perhaps whether this turn, uh, this change, this transition happens as predicted by uh, standard MSW or whether you need non-standard interactions. And by comparing oscillation parameters between neutrinos and antineutrinos from reactor observations, we can test the CPT invariance. So uh, one of the uh, interesting things we can do is uh, a different type of matter effects is uh, using the high energy, which for solar neutrinos means about 10 MeV, a new two beam, to look for flavor oscillations uh, from the earth. And the size of those can be parameterized by this Danida symmetry. And this is the Danida symmetry contours as a function of delta M squared to one, where this is the Hamland measurement. And you can see it ranges from 5% uh, uh, all the way to zero up here. And assuming the, uh, <clears throat> uh, we can reject the low daylight effect uh, hypothesis at greater than uh, five sigma, assuming the uh, uh, delta, M, uh, delta M square that is uh, at the best fit solar, and a little bit less if we assume uh, the Kamland value. And we can separate between the Kamland and solar 
uh, best fit day night. That's fine. Uh, at about the two sigma level. So as mentioned already, uh, we can test uh, the consistency of neutrino and anti-neutrino disappearance measurement of delta m squared two one, and that uh, uh, those two have to be the same uh, according to CPT invariance. So we can uh, look at the spectral shape and therefore uh, learn about the MSW effect as a function of neutrino energy. So uh, NSI or other beyond standard model physics can, uh, can change that. And obviously uh, this will depend on the energy threshold that hyper-K will be able to achieve. Uh, a lower threshold will uh, mean improved sensitivity. And uh, the threshold in turn will de depend somewhat on the photocathode coverage. So other solar neutrino studies is uh, uh, the search for HEP neutrinos, helium proton fusion, uh, one uh, possible way to terminate the PP chain. So far, this neutrino flux is unobserved. Within 10 years, you can expect a two to three sigma uh, significant measurement in, uh, in hyper-K. And uh, this is a plot of the time variation of the solar neutrino flux. So uh, we can monitor the, uh, the solar core uh, nuclear burning, it's kind of uh, nuclear reactor monitoring that is very remote. With, uh, we have about 130 events a day, about 4.5 MeV that compares to about uh, 20 solar neutrino events observed in super K. So I'll finish with a few remarks about uh, possible US contributions. Obviously the US is preoccupied with uh, getting Dune off the ground. <coughs> and so there's not much that we are allowed to do. Uh, so we focus on uh, triggering of uh, very low energy events. Uh, since we have some experience from that in, uh, in Super K and as a, as an example, we observe 2.2 MeV gammas from fast neutrons from showering muons. So this is the time difference to the muon. This is transverse correlation and uh, longitudinal correlation. And uh, uh, so how does that uh, system work? It's a kind of intelligent trigger or uh, uh, third level trigger. So we require a coincidence within 230 nanoseconds. And then we apply a specialized coincidence criterion, which is based on uh, hit time residuals, which depend on knowing the neutrino interaction vertex, if it's a neutrino interaction. And to guess that vertex, we use uh, four hit combinations. And then it uh, includes a complete vertex fit of all uh, hits at around the trigger time. And finally, we count how many con uh, contribute to, uh, to this triggering uh, that this must be at least 10 photons. A similar system for hyper-K, we plan to also include machine learning techniques. So uh, then uh, we have uh, cal energy calibrations using nitrogen 16 produced by 14 MeV neutrons from a DP fusion reactor. And the last point is we have done some work in improving the control of cosmogenic radioactivity, which is the dominant background in, uh, in hyper-K since it's located not, not so deep, unlike uh, Dune. And in super-K already, we have a thousand events a day from, uh, from that background. And it's gonna be many times larger at hyper-K and so we definitely need to get this under control. And in Super K, we demonstrated three new techniques to uh, reject this kind of background. The first one is using so-called neutron clouds. These are uh, neutrons from hadronic showers coming from the observation that most of the cosmogenic background is produced in hadronic showers. And this shows the spatial correlation between the 
cloud center and the spallation, observed spallation decay. Then a uh, second one is using most, uh, half of the spallation is actually multiple spallation. So uh, spallation background tags itself. And the third idea is to use uh, a kind of DEDX uh, optical reconstruction of the neon track. And that also shows a good correlation between spallation uh, production and, uh, and the peak of this DEDX. So as a consequence in super K, uh, we observed an additional solar neutrino signal that uh, wasn't there before. Uh, and basically cutting the uh, detected dead time due to accidental overlap in half. And this should be very useful for the uh, hypercase uh, astrophysical, uh, low energy astrophysical observations such as ESNB and solar neutrinos. So, in conclusion, uh, a Juno hypercomiokanda in June will likely dominate the uh, flavor physics in the near future. And hyper K construction has already started. Data will come in as soon as 2027. And hyper K experimental program is, uh, is complementary to Dunes. And so we should have both, and it will be good to have both. And in addition to just neutrino oscillation measurements, HyperK offers many other physics topics, including some that I had no time to talk about, like uh, checking the electron density in the Earth using the, uh, the matter effects. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much. For this nice and comprehensive presentation. Uh, you. Okay. Yeah, very nice overview of hyper K. Can you tell us a bit more about CNO neutrinos, what your sensitivity would be? Well, as I said, hyper K will have basically no sensitivity to CNO neutrinos. No sensitivity. Yeah, they make, they barely make shrink of light uh, and not very much. So I think it will not be feasible to uh, extract a signal from there. Plus, uh, at our location, which is fairly shallow, even if we had a detector that uh, scintillator detector there, it's unlikely that we would do better than Boaxino. Um, I have uh, two questions, if I may. The first one is, if anyone has already thought about the possibility of, at some point in the future, gadolinium doping also hypercamiocant, and if so, what would be the issues? Well, uh, uh, hyper-K is designed with being upgradable to uh, to uh, uh, gadolinium doping. Would it have any negative impact on say the long baseline program or so? I don't think it would have any negative impact on the long baseline program. Uh, the real uh, issue that uh, that could happen is uh, effect on uh, noisiness because you put a lot more gadolinium in there than in, uh, in the case of uh, mm. super K, obviously. And uh, because we have a bigger detector, we are more sensitive to optical transparency. Mm. And while we see no significant degradation in super K uh, so far with uh, gadolinium, uh, for hyper K, we would have to study how much of a negative yeah. effect that would no, be. I understand. And if I may, a second question, since we had this discussion in the morning. So from a theorist's point of view, one of the issues with super Kamiokande was it was extremely difficult to make use of that data because too little information was available. So no covariance matrices, no Monte Carlo events and so on. Is there any chance um, that, uh, hyper, that the hyper Kamiokande will be a little more open in that regard so that the data will be more useful uh, outside the collaboration? Yeah, I I hope so myself. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I, I can't say for sure, but yeah. uh, uh, one thing is that uh, that uh, the history of uh, of Super K is that it was primarily a Japanese uh, American collaboration, mm -hmm. and uh, Hyper K is a lot more international. Yeah, and so I think uh, the uh, influence of if other people from 
different countries feel the same, there's maybe increased pressure to improve uh, docu <laughs> documentation <laughs> to, uh, to make this feasible. I saw other hands there, I saw one and maybe you are. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the plot you showed that distinguished different supernova models. And I was wondering what it is, what piece of physics it is that is the just that makes the biggest effect. Is it like the time profile of antineutrinos or the spectrum? Is it a can you see new E's from the neutronization Hold burst? On. What is it that makes yeah. the difference? What's the most important piece of data? Yeah, I don't really have a plot for that, I have to admit, but uh, you had a grid. Yeah, you had I, a grid I with have the different this, models. Yeah. Sorry, I, I moved too fast here. And now I have to go through all the, yeah. This, yeah, that one, this that one, one right there. Yeah. So uh, I am, uh, to, to be honest, I don't really know the answer, but uh, I think it is both energy spectra and, uh, and the time profile. Okay, thanks. But, uh, I mean, the fact that with uh, you can get this kind of discrimination that you see on those plots with just 100 events uh, would impressive. imply that there's, it's more on the uh, side of the time profile than the spectrum. Okay. Another question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding the diffuse supernova background, uh, um, yeah, significances, yeah, that is like, the previous one. Yeah, that one. Uh, the plus minus sign that you have here is that for different models or is this uh, an actual like systematic uncertainty here on the numbers? On, uh, on the numbers? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, the difference in those. Uh, you, you mean on the uh, on on this bottom plot here, right? Uh, no, on, on the actual number that you have, if you see on, on, on this plot. No, the bullet point, the 17 oh, plus Oh, the, uh, the bullet yeah. point, yeah. No, that, uh, that is simply a reflection of, uh, of these different lines. So that is solely from the neutron tagging efficiency. Oh, so this is not for coming from the different models that no, go to the no, SMB? No, this is not from different models. This is simply coming from, uh, if you have better neutron tagging efficiency, then you have better uh, uh, selection efficiency of uh, inverse beta decays. Yes. And therefore, you get more candidates. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this kind of uncertainty would be much reduced if we would put in gadolinium in hypercase. Uh, then the tagging efficiency will uh, will move to in the eighty percentage region, and it will then nice. not be so strongly dependent on the uh, photocathode area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Uh, another thing that you mentioned in the beginning, but you didn't touch on, was the very high energy part of the energy range that you can actually see. So for, for said TeV, but uh, even above 100 GeV, uh, uh, what is the prospects for observation of the atmospheric flux in hyper K in the above 100 GeV bin? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, what kind of collapse? No, no, not collapse. The uh, atmospheric flux, the actual atmospheric, oh, atmospheric flux. flux. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, at very high energy, where yeah. the oscillations disappear. So the current yeah. uh, super yeah. key measurement my, goes my to guess, about twenty uh, GeV. I, I don't really know the answer, but my guess is that uh, that hyper K is still not big enough. I mean, uh, you can see that in ice cube, right? Uh, yeah. uh, is uh, I mean, we are still not on the order of gigatons. <laughs> So, uh, so my guess is that uh, uh, we can't uh, study uh, atmos atmospheric neutrinos without oscillations by moving to a very high uh, energy threshold. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question here. Um, thanks for a great talk. Um, so my question is, I have two questions really, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. The first question, um, newly on oxygen 16, can you get anything out of that? I mean, it, it's, it's interesting in that there's no real, you know, there's, there's no allowed weak channel strength in that. Uh, however, uh, above about 40 MeV, 38 MeV, something like that, 
um, then, then there is a fair, you should get a fair rate. Yeah, this is the uh, interaction rate. Of, yeah, and uh, of so can, so that you should be able to tag, right? Because it has, if it's axial current, it, it is. Yeah, well, it's like, it, it should be ba a backward peaked electron. Can you, can you, and you can tag that. Mm -hmm. Uh, since we have the supernova direction from the elastic uh, scattering channel, even if we didn't have an optical observation ah, okay. eventually, uh, we should be able to, uh, to, I mean, this backward asymmetry is relatively weak, right? Yeah, the weak current. And then, and, and then does that help you? Because that, there's an effective energy threshold there, which is high for supernova yeah. neutrinos. Hmm? Uh, help us uh, with respect to uh, well because most of your signal is going to be yeah, new yeah, e bar capture on yeah, on uh, protons yeah. whereas this is going to be new e capture yeah this these are pure new e events but i think our uh, dominant system uh, our dominant uh, sensitivity to new e events is coming from the elect el elastic scattering wow. itself there it's mixed with all other flavors but it's dominated by I'll electron mostly those will be lower energy those those will be lower energy, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I think no one is giving this much, uh, this channel much thought, and I think people should give it a bit more thought. Perhaps because in super K it is not so easy to observe due to the uh, uh, low event rate, but in hyper K we should get some. I agree with you. Thank you. Okay. We have another question. Thanks. Uh, this should be quite. Brief. Uh, so for the um, long baseline sensitivities, uh, I noticed here you've changed to uh, giving them as a function of POT per year. Normally they're given in terms of uh, snow mass years of exposure. I just wondered, is this also snow mass years uh, just converted to POT? Or is this a sort of realistic expected beam delivery uh, schedule, right? Because uh, th these sensitivities look very similar to the like hyper K design uh, report, which is given in terms of 10 years, yeah. that's 10 to the seven seconds, right, of accelerated uptime delivered. Yeah, I, I think this one is really for the uh, protons on target. But this is the, the expected beam delivery schedule. This is not some guesswork. This is like what's been promised by j -Path or something. I, just a handle on how realistic this is. Uh, yeah. How realistic this is? No, I've, uh, 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 I already answered a question privately this morning to someone. Uh, I, I'm not going to comment how, uh, how likely it is for accelerators to deliver what they're supposed to deliver. Okay. <laughs> I, got, <Fair> enough. <laughs> okay. I, I got burned on early on in my career with uh, working on uh, the uh, slack linear collider, which uh, uh, only at the very end delivered uh, its design. What they promised, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. Ob obviously there's going to be uncertainty in uh, fulfilling promises, but uh, <laughs> on the other hand, in Japan, uh, you're always supposed to fulfill your promises, as you're well aware. No, but coming back to this point, mm -hmm. when you say, I mean, trying to understand your schedule, when you say that you will start taking data in 2027, do you expect already your, your beam with full power? I would expect not, but, uh, but that's, the, my, the uh, that's assume, my personal opinion. No, no, uh, yeah, but the plots do not assume any uh, stages. I mean, like we are assuming in Dune, yeah. and we start with, I mean, you, you are assuming going directly day one with yeah. full power. So I have a little schedule here at the very end. Uh, I'm wondering whether I'm thinking of the right one, whether I included it here. Sorry, I have to move all the way to the end. But I may be thinking of something else here. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, no, this is this is the excavation, excavation. schedule. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. And, then... and, <clears throat> never mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the uh, in principle, uh, the beam should be ready by the time the detector is ready. But uh, it's no. I was thinking if you expect to have some kind of a you know early phase or second phase. I mean, ramping 
time. I mean, yeah, no, uh, that was the history with P to K. Yeah, but this is the history of, of many beams. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and that's why I'm saying, uh, from yeah. a personal opinion, uh, yes. uh, Probably and, not everything is going to work. As uh, I mean, sometimes uh, people evaporate the uh, the collimator. <laughs> you presented very little about and, the beyond the standard model searches. I mean, do you have a program for that on Hyper-K? Because I mean, that's something very. Uh, you I mean, mean for the uh, community is uh, very and, much and interested on that on that searches in general. So, uh, uh, do you, you have a specific, beyond the, the proton decay, of course? Do you have a specific beyond the standard model search searches program in Hyper-K? Yeah, of course. Uh, it, Can you comment it, on that? It, uh, I can't comment much on it, but uh, I didn't really prepare anything for BSM searches. But uh, obviously, with uh, I mean, focusing for a moment on the uh, on the uh, beam measurements. Obviously, uh, we give sensitivities in terms of the usual three flavor scenario, but uh, there's always the possibility that with high statistics, just like Dune, we expect a few thousand appearance events alone, uh, that something more, uh, will show up that, uh, that destroys the uh, usual scenario. And uh, then depending on what physics that is, uh, you, uh, uh, you can study it. Uh, with uh, with proton decay, uh, I know a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, if we observe uh, an, one of the more unusual modes, it will uh, definitely indicate beyond uh, even beyond beyond the standard model physics, such as B minus L violating uh, proton decay modes. My favorite one of those is uh, uh, neutron goes to three neutrinos. Which unfortunately hyper K is not going to address. Can I just ask something very quickly for the supernova part? Yeah. So you consider 300 events. I'm not sure why, because relevant numbers are 50,000 or so. But yeah. no, let's imagine that you have a close one, and then maybe you'll have a, a factor 10 further. Is pile up ever an issue? So, sorry. Is what? pile up? Of supernova neutrino events, is that ever uh, an issue? Uh, eventually, yes. Uh, and I'm a bit queasy about uh, about uh, on my little plot that I, oops, that I had here about uh, putting Betelgeuse on that plot. So for Betelgeuse, uh, you get uh, 10 to the nine events at uh, in 10 seconds. And uh, probably the bigger problem than, uh, than even uh, pile up of events is that the electronics is gonna give up from bandwidth point of view. So if the uh, supernova is very close, it's actually not good to have a giant detector. It's better <laughs> to have a, a, a smaller detector. Yeah, it's just a little one. But uh, obviously, if you had event pile up, then water shrink of detectors would be uh, hard pressed to uh, reconstruct such sure. events. Yeah, so so uh, so basically, uh, if events shouldn't pile up closer, uh, shouldn't follow on each other closer than uh, say half a microsecond. Okay, and so, so if you if you have uh, if you take one over that, uh, then uh, uh, at about two megahertz, you run into problems. Okay, do you know what that translates in terms of the distance? Uh, I haven't done the calculation okay. at what distance that uh, that occurs because it also depends a little bit on the uh, on the time profile. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that over coffee. Yes, yeah. I mean, we can do a back of the envelope calculation based on an average yeah, sure. rate in ten seconds, but uh, that's not really fair. Okay, very good. We had, uh, I think, a good session. We also followed by very good question. I think we have the coffee break now, and then we come back. Uh, when should we come back? Four. Okay, we come back at four for the...